hello everyone and happy feast of St. Ignatius. I am Father David Neuhaus, a Jesuit who works at the Jesuit Institute here in Johannesburg. Many of you will not know me because I'm new here, but very much enjoying being part of the team at the Jesuit Institute. And we are reaching out to you on this feast of St. Ignatius when the society, in fact, commemorates 500 years since the visit of St. Ignatius to Jerusalem. So what I would like to do today on this short video is speak about just uh, the visit of St. Ignatius to Jerusalem, describing the visit, but also attempting perhaps to evoke what might be the relevance of this visit for us in 2023, 500 years after Ignatius went to Jerusalem. I am going to be using a PowerPoint so we can follow this presentation, which hopefully will provoke some discussion among you as you gather to commemorate the Feast of St. Ignatius. Here we are, Ignatius in Jerusalem, 500 years. It's the commemoration 500 years ago he went to Jerusalem. And I know that I'm speaking to those who are much engaged in Ignatian spirituality. Much of what I'll say today is based upon Ignatius's autobiography. Again, we'll be focusing on that brief visit, which was very significant in the life of St. Ignatius, to the holy city and its, uh, envi its environs. So let's begin. As we all know, the story begins with the conversion of St. Ignatius to a new way of life after he was badly wounded at the Battle of Pamplona in 1521. In fact, yes, two years ago, the whole society, and I'm sure you as well, celebrated the 500th anniversary of St. Ignatius's conversion, him embarking on a new way that would lead him to found the Society of Jesus. At the very beginning of his autobiography, which I'm sure that you're all familiar with, that pilgrim story, Ignatius describes himself as a man given to worldly vanities and having a vain and overpowering desire to gain renown. It was that that was shattered at the Battle of Pamplona when he was badly wounded and had to be carried off the battlefield and went to Aspetia, to the castle of Loyola, to recuperate. And it's during that recuperation that, of course, his whole life was turned, turned around. So, as he describes in the Pilgrim's uh, story, that uh, autobiographical piece of writing that we have about St. Ignatius. And again, it's written in third person because somebody is writing down what they're hearing from, from Ignatius as he tells his story. We know the details of the pain that he went through, the leg that had to be operated on and broken and reset, and how still he was animated by a certain vanity, dreaming of being a chivalrous knight, and being able to go back to the court and have a, a good physical uh, presentation. But he writes in his, uh, his um, autobiography, or it's written about him, since he was an avid reader of books of worldly fiction, commonly called chivalrous romances, and since he, since he was feeling quite well, he asked for some such books to pass the time, books about knights winning the hearts of beautiful women, engaging in battles, doing all kinds of feats for that vanity and that um, renown in the world that he sought after. But in that house, however, and of course there he is in the castle of Loyola being looked after by his sister-in-law, in that house, however, they found none of the type he was used to reading. And so they brought him The Life of Christ and a book on the lives of the saints in Spanish. This was his only uh, reading possibilities. 
and he plunged into these books and found that they really provoked him to a new way of thinking. And of course, over the weeks and months, he's torn between his former life, desiring that chivalry that he had so sought after, and uh, what he read in the life of Christ and the saints, all about Dominic and Francis and the other saints who provoked him as well. And there he is torn between the two. And of course, this will lead him to realizing that as he contemplates on the sense of consolation that he derives from the readings about Jesus, about Mary, about the saints, he is left consoled even after he finishes reading. Whereas the books about chivalry and knights and beautiful ladies left him with a sense of enjoyment, but also a sense of emptiness. Now, what is interesting is that in the life of Christ, written by Ludolf, a Carthusian from Saxony, in the introduction, he would have read the following text. Let's read it, because this probably, and again, this is speculation, but probably would have inspired him to link these thoughts about Christ, these thoughts about the saints, with the city of Jerusalem and the Holy Land. In the preface to the life of Christ, this is what was written. Contemplating the Holy Land is certainly a holy and pious exercise. Who can narrate how the devotees walk through each of these places and with their spirit inflamed, kiss the earth, venerate and embrace the places where they know and learn that our Lord was, or has left, or has done something. Again, a text Ignatius would have read in that life of Christ that he had at his disposal. The illustration is, of course, of the tomb of Christ, the center of the Holy Land for the Christian, the place of also surely the resurrection, as we know that tomb was left empty. And so as Ignatius's process continues, there he is convalescing. He makes that link that will be so essential to his motivation to get up and walk on a new path. And so again, in the pilgrim story, it is written, when he thought of going barefoot to Jerusalem and eating nothing but herbs, and of imitating the saints in all the austerities they practiced, he not only found consolation in these thoughts, but even after they had left him, he remained joyful and happy. Of course, here we can see how the beginning of a process that will lead Ignatius to be a master of discernment. And that, of course, is one of the great gifts of Ignatian spirituality, discerning between those chivalrous stories of gaining earthly renown, feeding into his own vanity, and the stories of imitating Jesus, Mary, and the saints. And these stories lead, leave him feeling joyful and happy. We see here a scene, again, in that castle of Loyola, where he has a vision of the Virgin Mary and the child coming to him to console him and strengthen him. Now, slowly but surely, and it will take months as he's engaged in this mental, spiritual process, his body is healing. And as he comes to the end of his period of convalescence, his determination sets him off on a new way. And so again, we all have read ah, the pilgrim story. We know the life of Ignatius. We move to the next step of that journey that step by step will take him closer to the fulfillment of this desire of going as a pilgrim to Jerusalem. And again, I read from the story, he's left uh, Aspetia, the castle of Loyola. He's gone on his way. He stops at a shrine. We remember that. But his aim is to go to Montserrat, a very big uh, monastery on a high mountain, far removed from the world where he wants to spend time in prayer, ah, there he will transform from an aristocrat and a knight 
into the poor pilgrim that will uh, take, take him on his way. So just before coming to a large town, before reaching Montserrat, he there wanted to purchase the clothes he intended to wear when he went to Jerusalem. That determination animates the whole first part of this story of the pilgrim to go to Jerusalem. He bought some sackcloth. It was of a loose weave and prickly to the touch and asked them to make it into a long garment that he would go down to, that would go down to his feet. He bought himself a pilgrim's staff and a small hollow gourd and attached everything to the saddle atop his mule. In the scene, we see it is after he has cast off in Montserrat his, his garments of chivalry and uh, donned the pilgrim's uh, garment, the simple sackcloth. And uh, late in the night, he gives uh, his former clothes to a beggar. We remember, of course, that very touching story of how he is then pursued by people who want to inquire about whether he really gave these clothes to the beggar. The poor man had been arrested and accused of stealing. And Ignatius will shed tears about the suffering that he has caused this poor man. I'm calling him Ignatius all the time, but we do remember that his name uh, is Inigo, Inigo the, the Pilgrim. And so off he goes. And it will be some time before he actually accomplishes the trip to Jerusalem. He leaves Montserrat. He ends up in Manresa trying to avoid uh, some uh, great possessions, scared that he'll be recognized and treated as someone important because that's what he wanted to be in his former life. So he remains kind of hidden at Manresa. And in Manresa, he'll stay for many months. It will be a very important time. I think that we remember that. But we go on because our aim here is to really see Ignatius in Jerusalem and understand what happened there. So the time he had set for his departure for Jerusalem was fast approaching. And so from Manresa, very rich time, but a time of great travail and suffering as well, a time of great spiritual enlightenment, he'll make his way to Barcelona. He'll be back later in Barcelona. And then from Barcelona, he must go to Rome to get permission in order to go to the Holy Land. Remember, at that time, free access to the Holy Land was not a possibility. The Holy Land was uh, under the, the Turkish, under Turkish rule, and the Catholic Church controlled very carefully who went there, so that in no way would access be blocked to those who were deemed worthy to go there. And from Rome, he'll eventually go to Venice, from where he will take the boat that will take him on a long journey, a long, difficult journey uh, to the Holy Land. Today, we just board an airplane. But in those days, there were ships that took people around and took a long time, and there were lots of dangers on the way. But anyway, the pilgrim's uh, story continues. When he describes what happened in Rome, everyone who spoke to him in Rome, knowing that he had no money to go to Jerusalem, tried to talk him out of his trip, offering, offering him all kinds of reasons why it would be impossible for him to find a free passage. Again, Ignatius, very much relying on the grace of God, refuses to take money. And in fact, when money is given to him, he'll give it away. But again, determination, his faith, and the strong spiritual experiences he's had in Loyola, in Manresa, on Montserrat, uh, uh, really convince him that he can go ahead. He's, he's under the protection of God. But he felt a firm certainty within his soul that he would find a way of going to Jerusalem. And of this he had no doubt. After he had received the blessing of Pope Hadrian VI, he then set out for Venice. So from Rome, he must go to Venice. Of course, he's doing all this on foot. Uh, again, a lot of dangers on the way, some of which he describes in the pilgrim story. 
But we want to focus again on his going to Jerusalem. And so there he is in Venice waiting and will take some time for a ship to take him. And finally, he boards a ship. Yes, there will be a little intervention on his behalf so that he can get on a ship, even though he has almost nothing. And the voyage to Jerusalem will be long and arduous. It will take him from Venice to Cyprus. From Cy in Cyprus, he'll have to change and take another ship. Again, ah, he describes some of those adventures on the, on the ship in his, in his uh, account of the pilgrim. Here we see this lithograph. He's going to Jerusalem. There he is praying. And he says that he was very much consoled all the time during that arduous voyage. Relations with the other passengers were not simple, as Ignatius did not approve of a lot of, of their behavior. But there he is. You see him on the prow of the ship, and he has these visions of Jesus encouraging him on his way. And this is indeed what he writes during all this time, this time of travel. Our Lord appeared to him often giving him great consolation and determination. Again, he's going to Jerusalem, and he's sure that that's where he must go, and he's sure that that's where he must be. And so finally, after long, long, long weeks of travel, they will arrive in Jerusalem. Interestingly, we know that the boat missed the port of Jaffa, which would be where they would embark, and missing it, continued on its way toward Gaza and then had to turn around and come back and wait uh, for a good long period of time, almost two weeks before they could actually disembark. They had to wait for permission from the Turks and then wait for the Franciscan monks who are the custodians of the holy places to come and fetch them from the ship and take them to Jaffa. And so, yes, they finally arrive. On the 1st of September, 1523, they land at the Jaffa port. Now, interestingly, Ignatius writes very few details about his visit to Jerusalem. We're going to now look into that visit to Jerusalem in some detail. And you may ask, where do these details come from? Well, we're very fortunate that two of the people who were with Ignatius, a Spaniard and a Swiss, a Swiss man, kept journals, and we have found those journals and have access to them, and so we can plot out in some detail the exact visit of Ignatius to the Holy Land, the places that they went. He would only go to the central part of the Holy Land. They were not able to go up to Galilee because the ship could not land near to Galilee and the in the port up there. And so they land at Jaffa. You see in the lithograph Jaffa from around that period, a little town. Today underneath you see Jaffa as it's grown uh, today in the 20th, 21st century. And from Jaffa, going through the registration process, getting off the ship, uh, again being accommodated by the Franciscans, they will make their way to Rumle. Rumle was the most important city, our administrative center at that time. And it's from Rumle that they could make their way to Jerusalem. They had to wait, and it would be a night journey, leaving on the eve of uh, the 3rd of September, Thursday, the 3rd of September. They would uh, make their way to Jerusalem in a cortege, in a, in a group of people, including some Jewish merchants that had arrived from Egypt and the group of pilgrims. There were about 17 of them in the group. And then, of course, the great day. Ah, the great day would be the arrival in Jerusalem. But, of course, looking at Jerusalem from afar, we have when the pilgrim did see the city, he experienced great consolation. And then a little further, he, it's written, he felt the same devotion on all his visits to the holy places. He made a firm decision to remain in Jerusalem, constantly visiting the holy places. This is almost a decision for his life. Uh, again, this desire to go to Jerusalem had accompanied him from the moment of his conversion. 
And now two years later, he finds himself in, Jer in Jerusalem and he feels that sense that this is where he must be. In addition to this devout desire of his, he was also intent on helping souls. And for this purpose, he had with him letters of recommendation to the Custos or to the provincial of the Franciscans who is called the Custos, the custodian of the Holy Land, the, the, the Franciscan who stands at the head of the order in the Holy Land and its environs and makes sure that the holy places are looked after in the name of the Catholic Church. That, of course, will be shared with the Orthodox Church and the Armenian Church, as is true today as well. But he keeps all of this very quiet because he's not sure how this intention will be received. His intention to stay in the holy place, in the holy places, particularly in Jerusalem, and help people looking for God. This is what he's been doing already on the way, and especially in Manresa. And he intends to continue doing this uh, in the Holy Land. Now, we're going to go step by step through this visit to the Holy Land again. I think that we can sense the excitement of Ignatius, his devotion to these places where he's touching the places where our Lord walked, where our Lord uh, acted, and not only our Lord, but also places connected to the whole biblical story. And again, Ignatius has become more and more familiar with this story uh, from the time of his conversion onwards. So let's look at the itinerary as it developed day to day. First of all, uh, the center of the Franciscans at that time was the big convent on Mount Zion. That is no longer the case. But on Saturday, the 5th of September, the first full day that the pilgrims are in Jerusalem, they have mass in the Senecal and then make their way to visit the Holy Sepulchre that we call in the Eastern tradition, the place of the resurrection. Uh, interestingly, in the Latin tradition, the focus is on the tomb, and of course, it's an empty tomb. But in the Eastern tradition, we focus on that event, that event of salvation, which is Christ's resurrection. The next day, again, Mass in the edicle of the Holy Sep Sepulchre. And the edicle you can see there is the place where Jesus was laid and the antechamber, which contains a piece of rock, of that rock that covered the mouth of the tomb. Uh, what you see above is Mount Zion, where we have the Senecal. I hope that we all remember that the Senecal is the place of the Last Supper, underneath which, uh, in the structure that stood in the time of St. Ignatius and remains there today, we have the tomb of King David. And above it, we have the chamber of the descent of the Holy Spirit, uh, the event of Pentecost. So again, a very important place. The Franciscans are centered on that place, but of course have responsibilities in all of the holy places to make sure that pilgrims can get, have access to these holy places and that these holy places are kept in good order. Again, uh, slowly but surely will develop over the centuries the collaboration among the Franciscans, the Greek Orthodox, and the Armenians. So there we are on Sunday, 6th of September. He has Mass in the Edicule of the Holy Sepulchre. The next day, another very important place will be visited, and we will see later that this place figures very much in what Ignatius does recount of his visit to the Holy Land, the Mount of Olives. And we can remember that on the Mount of Olives, there are a number of places that are very, very important for Christians. On the Mount of Olives, we have the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus spent the night before he was arrested in deep prayer in the olive grove, coming there from Mount Zion, from the Senecal, where he had celebrated the Last Supper. And then there will be a place that will mark the place where Jesus cried over Jerusalem, as is recounted in the Gospel of Luke. And on the top of the Mount of Olives, a special place for St. Ignatius, we'll see this a little later, the place from which Jesus ascended into heaven. And I should mention it as well, our post-New uh, Testament tradition, at the foot of the Mount of Olives, just opposite the Garden of Gethsemane, the place where Mary was laid 
after she had fallen asleep. Although, of course, once again, we know Mary was assumed into heaven. The following day, the 8th of September, is the feast of the Nativity of Mary. And Ignatius will journey to Bethlehem. Again, with the group of pilgrims. Remember, he's not alone. Most of this is with a group of pilgrims, most of these visits, led by Franciscans uh, with guards. Again, the Holy Land is not a, not a Christian land. And so there was a need to guarantee the safety of these foreign Christians going around the land. And so they journey to Bethlehem and visit the places there. Again, we know that in Bethlehem, we have the big Basilica of the Nativity, and Ignatius will have time there to spend in prayer. The following day, Wednesday, the 9th of September, they go to Ein Karim, to the traditional place of the birth of John the Baptist, and of course, as well, the place where Mary encounters Elizabeth as she comes before Jesus' birth, just before the birth of John the Baptist, to spend time with her elderly relative who miraculously has fallen pregnant and will bear John the Baptist. We know that that's the scene where Mary cries out in joy, the Magnificat. The following day, on Thursday, the 10th of September, they will visit the Kidron Valley, the valley that runs beneath Jerusalem. And again, important places there connected with the Old Testament and the New. Uh, for example, Hakaldama. Ah, the place which was bought in order to uh, inter Judas Iscariot after he committed suicide, uh, after the, the betrayal of Jesus, tombs in the valley. On fr Friday, the 11th of September, they will spend time in prayer in a cave on Mount Zion, traditionally regarded as the place where King David composed the Psalms. And that night, they will spend in the Holy Sepulchre. And then after these intense visits, and again, going through the land, uh, even though it's a very short distance from our point of view in modern times, Jerusalem and Bethlehem being very close together, these would have been very arduous days. The Saturday and Sunday, 12th and 13th of September, they stay resting in their uh, lodgings. And then the pilgrimage continues on Monday, the 14th of September, another great feast of the church, the feast of the exaltation of the Holy Cross. They depart for Jericho, going via Bethany. Again, Bethany, the place of the tomb of Lazarus, where Jesus calls Lazarus out of the tomb, the home of Martha and Mary, and then on to Jericho. Uh, Jericho, we know Jericho is the city of Zacchaeus but also the city of Rahab and Jesus' cure just outside Jericho of the blind man. But the importance of Jericho also is that it's just next to or not far from the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized. And so the next day on Tuesday, the 15th of September, they go to the Jordan River. And so this will be uh, the visits to the most important holy places in the area of Jerusalem, again, arduous, even though the geography is, these places are very close to one another, but arduous journeying. From Wednesday to Sunday, the 16th to the 20th of September, 1523, the pilgrims are confined. They cannot go out because a big group of soldiers has arrived from, uh, from Istanbul. They are roaming around the city. The Franciscan, Franciscans regard it not safe for the pilgrims to go out, so they're encouraged to stay in. Surely that was a time of prayer for, for Ignatius reflecting on what he's seeing. And again, the devotion that he expresses coming into contact with these places that the church fathers have sometimes referred to as a fifth gospel, the land are being able to experience Jesus, not in the books of the gospel, but now in the land in which Jesus lived, touching, seeing, uh, feeling, being able to smell and hear the sounds of the land that was home to Jesus. And again, not only Jesus, 
that all the prophets and kings and sages and patriarchs and priests that prepared for Jesus' coming, the people out of which Jesus was born, the people of Israel, and then again are the land after Jesus ascends into heaven, the land will, that will be the first home of the church for from out of Jerusalem uh, to the ends of the earth will go the message borne by those apostles and disciples who followed Jesus. So, yes, this is uh, the, the end of this uh, first uh, period of going through the Holy Land, uh, appropriately ending on the 21st of September in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And then comes the very, very important day. Ignatius has already expressed interest in staying in the Holy Land to the superior of the Franciscan house that is accommodating him. And the superior explains to him that this will have to be presented to the provincial, to the custos, to the head of the Franciscans. And so Ignatius is called to a meeting with the custos in Jerusalem. The custos has come back from Bethlehem and is now ready to meet with Ignatius. And he's called to the meeting. And it will be, again, a shattering meeting. Let's remember Ignatius's dreams as a earthly chivalrous knight have been shattered at Pamplona. And now the dream of staying in Jerusalem will be shattered in the meeting with the Kustos. The Kustos informs Ignatius after listening to Ignatius's desire to stay in the Holy Land. He says, he should be ready to leave with the other pilgrims on the following day. So the Custos is not interested that Ignatius stays. He says, no, 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 we've had bad experiences. Some of the pilgrims have been kidnapped. We've had to ransom them. It's cost us a lot of money. It's a great, great headache for us. Pilgrims can come, those that are approved by Rome, but then they must go away. And Ignatius replied that his decision to remain was fixed and that nothing could prevent him from carrying it out. With great honesty, he gave the provincial to understand that though the provincial did not agree with him, and since this was not a matter that obliged under sin, he would not renounce his plans out of fear. So Ignatius is saying, I understand you don't want me to stay, but you're not my superior. I do not, I'm not obliged to obey you. You've expressed your opinion. I want to stay. And then the provincial reveals to him something that will change Ignatius's mind. In answer to him, the provincial said that they, the Franciscans, had authority from the apostolic see, from the Pope, to expel or keep anyone they chose and to excommunicate anyone who refused to obey. And his case, they were of the opinion that he should not remain. Now Ignatius is faced with a new reality, again calling for a discernment process. He is determined to stay, but the, the Custos, the provincial of the Franciscans, has explained to him that, well, if he stays, he might be excommunicated. For indeed, the Pope has given authority to the uh, Franciscans. As Ignatius had made, has made clear that he doesn't agree with the opinion of the provincial, but now he's faced with a decision to obey the church. The provincial was willing to show him the bulls empowering them to excommunicate. So the provincial, realizing that in front of him is a man who is totally determined, says, I can show you other declarations from the Pope that give me the power to excommunicate you if you do not agree to leave. But he said, he had no need to see them, since he believed their reverences, and since they arrived at their decision in accordance with the authority they possessed, he would obey them. Now, here is something remarkable. This man has been animated for two years by the desire to stay in the Holy Land, and now he's faced with a very, very important decision. He is going to obey the church. Again, Ignatius' desire was that the Jesuits would be a group of men who are under the authority of the church 
and living fully the vow of obedience. This is just Ignatius as a pilgrim. He's many years before founding the society, but we already here see something very remarkable, uh, the decision that he must obey. And so he knows he's going to leave. But then comes another very interesting incident. The writing continues, since it was not our Lord's will for him to remain in the holy places, a burning desire took hold of him to make a return visit to the Mount of Olives before leaving. On the Mount of Olives, there is a stone from which our Lord ascended into heaven, and his footprints are still visible there. This was what he wanted to see again. Now, interesting. Ignatius wants to go and see the footprints, the last footprints that Jesus left before ascending into heaven. And I've often thought why, and I think many who have read carefully uh, the pilgrim's story have asked why was it so important for him to see those footprints. And I think in a certain sense, again, he's come to the Holy Land animated by this desire to be in touch with the land that hosted Jesus. And here, in this place on top of the Mount of Olives, in the Shrine of the Ascension, he would be able to gaze on the last imprint Jesus left in the world. I think that perhaps one of the reasons is that Ignatius is very much aware that he and all of us, and in a special way perhaps the company that he would found later and those attached to the spirituality that he would formulate, they are called to be in that place that Jesus has left Fill that absence, re-present Jesus. Jesus is absent as he goes up into heaven, and it's upon us to make him present. And so that realization in that place that this was the last time that Jesus would be physically present in a historical, of course, resurrected body, 40 days after he has been resurrected, he will ascend into heaven. It will be important to be exactly there to go out from there and fill the world with the presence of Jesus as witnesses. Ah, this is exactly the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles. So again, this was what he wanted to see again. Thus, without saying anything and without taking a guide, and that was not very prudent, but certainly against the rules, because again, they went around guided by Franciscans and with a guard. So thus, without saying anything and without taking a guide, he slipped away from the others and went by himself to the Mount of Olives. After he had said his prayers with heartfelt consolation, he got this desire to go to uh, Bethpej, or as we say in Arabic, Beit Faji. He wanted to go there, uh, just on the other side of the Mount of Olives, again, visiting the places there, Betfagi will be the place where Jesus on Palm Sunday uh, is accommodated. Uh, he will go out from there on the donkey and go down the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem, uh, the Palm Sunday event. So he goes from the Mount of Olives, from the top, where he's visited the Shrine of the Ascension, and he makes his way to Betfagi. But while there, he remembered that on the Mount of Olives, he had not taken full notice of the direction in which the right foot was pointing and which way the left. On his return there, he gave his scissors, I think, to the guards so that they would let him enter. He had to bribe the guards. Both the first time he went, he gave a pocket knife. Now he gives his scissors again to go into the place and spend time observing, contemplating, Reflecting on uh, the stone, Ignatius says, uh, right and left. In fact, I've been there many, many times. There's only one footprint there. Very difficult to make out. Perhaps it was a little different when Ignatius was there. But again, that attachment to this place, almost the only place he describes in any detail, is very interesting. And again, I think it's because he knows that his feet that have carried him here must now carry him from this place as he re-presents Jesus to the world. Him, the whole church, 
but perhaps in a special way, are Ignatius with his slowly formulating spiritual exercises, the group that he will found and the spirituality that they will promote, representing Jesus, the Jesus that from here has become absent as he ascends into heaven, must now be represented. So Ignatius leaves Jerusalem. The journey will be a difficult one back uh, to Europe. And when he realizes uh, that this dream has been shattered, again, remember a second dream. The first dream was to be a knight. The second dream was to live this kind of very simple, devout, holy life in Jerusalem, helping souls. The second dream has been shattered. The big question is, where to now? And so, a little later in the story, it is written, after the said pilgrim came to realize that it was God's will that he not remain in Jerusalem, he kept wondering what he ought to do and finally was inclined towards spending some time in studies in order to help souls. And so he decided to go to Barcelona. Remember, he had passed through Barcelona on his way, uh, hurrying towards uh, Rome to get permission to go to the Holy Land, then Venice to take the ship. Now he's back and he says, what am I going to do? And again, are uh, discerning, slowly but surely, feeling the impulse uh, to go and study so that he can help souls more than he could without the studies. And he goes back to a regular school. In all humility, he sits among kids uh, and learns Latin. These studies will then lead to him finally going to Paris to do special studies in uh, philosophy, theology, and uh, then... Uh, there around him will gather a group of men impressed by this very devout, very intense, very spiritually oriented pilgrim who is there, and they will gather around him. And in 1534, that group will band together in a more formal way as a group that will slowly evolve into the society of Jesus. So Jerusalem seemingly has been left behind but not because the dream of Jerusalem will still animate Ignatius. And at the time that they come together, uh, this group of men in, in Paris, it will again uh, come to the fore. By this time, they had all decided, and there you see the first group of disciples, uh, Ignatius there kneeling as they uh, make a kind of vow. By this time, they had all decided on what they would do. That is, go to Venice and from Venice to Jerusalem and spend their lives there helping souls. Again, that initial determination that Ignatius is placed and now Ignatius with his companions, their places in Jerusalem. But having the experience of what had already happened, they are cautious. And so what is written is, and if permission be not granted them to remain in Jerusalem, they would return to Rome and offer themselves to the vicar of Christ, to the Pope, so that he could use them wherever he judged it would be for the greater glory of God and the good of souls. Now, I think that this is a very important point here, because first of all, Ignatius senses again that determination to go to Jerusalem. But already he's understood the first time that it wasn't God's will that he stay there. And now many years have passed. We're in 1534. Eleven years have gone by. And as this group comes together, this small company uh, comes together, that initial vision is again uh, alive. They'll go to Jerusalem and they'll help souls there. They'll spend their lives in the holy city. But perhaps, again, God will reveal to them that this is not his will. And so the openness then to give themselves in service to the church. Let the Pope decide where it is best for them to be. Now this time, they will not reach Jerusalem. Ah, They will go to Venice 
and realize there are no ships going to the Holy Land. There's no possibility for them to go. And they'll read that event again, this developing art of discernment. They'll read that event. Ships were not sailing to the east that year because the Venetians had broken off relations with the Turks. And so with the breaking of any relationship, ships from Venice could not land in the Holy Land. And this then will be read as the need to reorient, the need to go to Rome. And we know the story from the, uh, from the, the, the narrative of the pilgrim that they will go to Rome and present themselves to the Pope. And in Rome, of course, Ignatius will stay heading the, the Society of Jesus and sending uh, men to all parts of the world. Interestingly, <laughs> the Jesuits um, will not establish a permanent presence in Jerusalem until the 20th century. It's only in 1911 ah, that Jesuits again will arrive in Jerusalem and attempt to set up a presence. A house will be uh, begun, building a house, land after land has been bought. 1925, 1927, the house will be uh, consecrated by the Latin archbishop, the Latin patriarch. And since then, there has been a very small uh, Jesuit community in the Holy Land, and it remains there today. In fact, I'm a member of that community in Jerusalem. But again, uh, the determination of Ignatius has led him on a journey not to Jerusalem, but away from Jerusalem. But Jerusalem has been an integral part of this voyage. And Jerusalem remains a very central part because, of course, in the most important uh, heritage we have from St. Ignatius, the spiritual exercises, which all of us know well, Jerusalem remains there as a constant point of reflection. For Jerusalem is the city, the center of the world in a medieval perspective, the city where the event of our salvation took place, that event made up of two happenings, Jesus' crucifixion, his death on the cross, and his resurrection. So every Christian is re really reflecting on that place. But again, uh, the strange development of Ignatius in Jerusalem, that Ignatius is led away from Jerusalem, even though Jerusalem will remain at the center of his consciousness, he is led away from Jerusalem time and time again to do great things for the greater glory of God. Now, in the spiritual exercises, and I'll end uh, with this, we have that reflection on Jerusalem, and I just like to read one place where Jerusalem is particularly present, and it is that central uh, contemplation on the two standards. And I read, The one of Christ, our supreme captain and Lord, the other of Lucifer, the mortal enemy of our human nature. And then, a little later, the mental representation of the place. Here it will be to see a vast plain covering all the region about Jerusalem, where the supreme leader of the good is Christ our Lord, and another plain in the region of Babylon, where the evil chieftain of the enemy is Lucifer. Again, we are contemplating Jerusalem, seeing it as, as the very place uh, where Jesus, our supreme captain and Lord, stands, are uh, getting ready and going on with the battle uh, against the forces of evil. So I'd like to end uh, this presentation for the Feast of St. Ignatius with a question. And I think it's an ongoing question for all of us engaged uh, in promoting Ignatian spirituality, Jesuits and all of the collaborators with Jesuits and those who work in the field of Ignatian spirituality. What can we learn? Ah, and I hope this might open a discussion. What can we learn about the art of discernment by reflecting on Ignatius' ex experience with Jerusalem? Again, an experience that really covers his life. The determination to be there and the understanding that God wants him to be somewhere else. 
but Jerusalem remains at the center of that process. And so on this feast of St. Ignatius, I'd like to once again wish you a blessed feast as we reflect on Ignatius in Jerusalem, discerning ever more how we can help people live their lives as God calls them to live. God bless you all. Thank you.